we were going to go through the products and devices that are on the market and how in Intel contributes to Android uh, development and enablement. That's the part of my voice, too. I just got back from the Samsung conference and before that, the on Android conference. Uh, we're going to talk really quickly about what is an ADK that packages multiple different architectures inside it and how that works. After that, we're going to look at Intel's third part. Could, could it be a little quieter in here, please? Thank you. And after that, we're going to look at third-party support uh, for Intel Android, and then Intel's tools for Android. So I'm going to skip right to the tablet uh, product roadmap and say back in 2012 is when we introduced Clover Trail, which was the first processor that we were really targeting towards a mobile environment. And this this uh, this was put onto the Motorola Razor I, onto different Windows 8 connected standby machines, and it was the first processor that really showed that Intel was capable of producing not just a, a high performance, you know, Xeon server end processor, but we're also aggressively moving into the, the mobile area as well. And if you've seen a lot of the, uh, the undertakings at Intel, you know that Intel's putting a substantial amount of effort right now to moving into the mobile area. Uh, a very large portion of the corporation is moving in that direction. So in 2013, we introduced Overture Plus, which is what powers this device, which is a Lenovo K900. And I've got a slide of other devices too. It also powers Samsung Galaxy Tab 3, which was a big hit over at the Samsung Developer Conference last week. Six weeks ago, we announced uh, Bay Trail, which I believe is actually farther down in, in my area. The Bay Trail takes Intel's graphics and actually moves it directly onto the CPU just like the core processors. The current generation of processors here uh, have a separate graphics chip. Bay Trail is going to move it on there. J Bay Trail also uh, has a nearly three times the performance of Clover Trail Plus, and it runs on one-fifth the power of Clover Trail Plus. And so this is going to be, and in addition to that, it runs on a 14 nanom nanometer manufacturing process. What that means in general is just that we can shrink the die, we can increase the performance, and decrease the power. So this, this will be a very serious competitor, and a lot of OEMs are going to base their, you know, their devices uh, on this processor architecture, which is why we're here talking about it. So here are some of the smartphones that have been available. A lot of them are available in Europe and in Asia and other parts of the world. Um, these are, for instance, the Motorola Razor I is well known. Lenovo has made several Orange in France and the western part of Europe has been integrating our processors into their smartphones. And here is the current generation of Intel smartphones. This is in all of them. I will encourage you guys to come up here and play with the Motorola K900. It's, uh, I use it as my, my uh, full-time phone now, uh, and, and I like it. It's got a high resolution. It's, it's uh, 1080 by 1920 resolution, and um, I get about a day and a half, two days of battery life on it. So it's, it's, it's pretty nice. All right, here are some of the tablets that we have recently seen in the market. The Dell Venue 8 and 7 and 8 inch are recently out. I got to hold one today for the first time. Thank you very much through the room. Uh, the, I mentioned the Samsung Galaxy Tab. Asus also has a couple of designs using Intel. And the next generation, like I said, is Bay Trail. And that's going to be aimed mainly at the tablet market. And then Merrifield is going to be aimed at the smartphone market. The difference is, is that Merrifield is an SOC. It's a system on a chip. Both of these are going to be using um, uh, Trigate technology, which if you want to learn more about that, you can ask me about later. How to target multiple Android uh, platforms with a single NDK is actually fairly easy. So there's been a lot of confusion, first of all, on terminology here, and I, I apologize for that. One thing that I hope I can clarify is what exactly we mean by an NDK application. So NDK refers to Google's Google Android NDK download, which is a download that integrates into it a C and C++ uh, plus compiler, GCC, and a tool chain for building C and C++ applications on Android. 
When we say an NDK application, most of these applications actually launch as Java applications, and then they use JNI or some other mechanism to fall down into native code. So when we say we're looking for an NDK application, we, what we mean is we're looking for an application that uses some native code. It doesn't have to be entirely native code, it can be Java just calling down. For instance, I have on here, a, I have on here an application. Uh, I, I, I tend to hobby around with, with uh, cryptography. So I have on here an application that will start the camera, let you take a, uh, a bunch of data from the camera, and then it turns it into a public and private key pair. So the public and private key pair is done all in C and C++. The camera side is done in Java. So that's an example of the type of application that we're looking for. We're not looking for something that's 100% C and C++. We're looking for components that are optimized in native compiled code for Intel. Are there any questions on that point? Is it clear? Great, I see lots of money heads. People back there will be happy. So the first thing you should know, and I, I think you do know, just judging from this crowd, is that most Android applications are just going to run on Intel processors. Intel spends a lot of time on Delvic, which is the engine which runs you know, Android applications. We have an entire team that's optimizing it and working with Google. So for the most part, most applications are just going to simply run. Uh, for those that uh, use the NDK, most of these applications, the ones that are compiled for ARM, will also run. So for instance, if you get an a ARM compiled application and you're running on the same Sun Galaxy Cat 3, it's going to run just fine. I'll, I'll talk about that in, I'll talk about it now. Uh, that is called the NDK bridging technology, which is down here. This is technology that Intel has implemented and we license to the OEM manufacturers, for instance Samsung in this case. And what it is, is it's basically a, a software-based uh, interpreter. It's a, it's a runtime interpreter that takes ARM instruction sets and changes them into Intel-based instruction sets. So the, uh, if you do create a ARM application, you can't just run it on there, you are going to take a performance hit, of course, and that's why we're out here advocating that people should actually build for both, both for ARM and for Intel. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that Intel is a huge contributor to the Linux kernel. In fact, we are the number one contributor to the Linux kernel. Uh, we passed up Red Hat as of uh, 2011, I believe. I think it was around the beginning of April in that area. But uh, we are the number one contributor to the Linux kernel. Uh, and via that, we're also a huge contributor to the Android project. We also spend a lot of time working with different manufacturers, optimizing hardware and firmware. I talked about tuning Dalvik. We do a lot of porting and optimizing of browser-based applications. Um, this is something else that most people don't know, that Intel is the number three contributor to the WebKit project, followed by, uh, or preceded by, Google and Apple. Uh, we actually just took the number three spot. Uh, for a while, the uh, other category was number three. Um, but uh, right now, we're the number three contributor to the, to the WebKit project, and also working with Google and on the link as well. Uh, for those of you that are in the HTML5 talk, I'm going to talk about Crosswalk, which is a runtime that Intel is building that uh, enables you to create HTML5 applications on uh, mobile browsers, and it's based off the latest version of Chrome, not the version of Chrome that's on Android, or the web view. Oh, uh, Intel is working on a 64-bit version of Android and has been working on that in collaboration with different partners for quite a while. All right, so configure your NDK. This, this is like NDK 101. If you want to actually compile for a different architecture, what you need to do is you need to set, uh, you need to change your bake files. And one way that you can do this, the simplest way, is to set app underscore ABI to all. This is going to compile your application for all, each of the uh, system images that you have installed through the Android SDK Manager. So that, that right now actually includes ARM, it includes ARM v7, ARM v5, Intel, and MIPS. Somebody, somebody at the Samsung conference actually showed me a, a MIPS-based Android device. It's the first time I've ever seen one. So if, if you know of a MIPS-based Android device, I'm, I'm actually kind of on the hunt. They're rare creatures. 
Uh, so you can set this to x86, and you can also put multiple parameters on here. You can say x86 space uh, on v7, or you can just say all. And that is um, a environmental variable or command line variable that is passed in the NDK build script. I'm just curious, uh, the, uh, the line of code was compared to ARM? Which one? The one, the the one that compared uh, run NDK build to ARM. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble understanding you. So I'm comparing to an ARM chip. A RAM chip? Yeah, ARM versus Intel. Uh, ARM, ARM yeah. versus Intel. Yeah. 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 So when when you when you compile your code, you can change your make files to target multiple different architectures. And this is the environmental variable you use for that. Okay. Okay. Can you go ahead and tell, tell us about that, that crosswalk thing? That yeah, it, we'll, we'll talk about crosswalk in the HTML5 talk after dinner. I'm, I'm actually starving myself, so we're good. Is the food arrived? Don't say that. Don't say that. Okay, I'm going to take 45 minutes. Five minutes. I'll try. Yeah. Okay. Okay, packaging for multiple APKs, you can talk to me about that later. Basically, if you have an APK that is um, targeting multiple architectures, you've probably got a libs directory, and underneath that, you've got an architecture directory. And inside the architecture directory, you have uh, compiled libraries, shared object libraries, for each of the different platforms. Now, fat binaries include all of these in one APK which is not really considered the best practice anymore. Uh, it used to be for a while before Google Store gave people, uh, didn't have to give them finer controls on uploading packages and associating with apps. So fat binaries include all of them in one download, and uh, thin binaries actually separate them out. Third-party library support for x86, here are the gaming engines that we have ported over into x86. Havoc Anarchy, I know that there was uh, some, there was there were a couple of gamers in this room that talked to me. Uh, I would really highly recommend going to see Havoc and Anarchy. Originally it was targeted at AAA gaming titles, so uh, multi-million dollar projects. And recently it is, it's actually been acquired by Intel. And we've open sourced all the code to it. And we are trying to retool it and bring it uh, more as a tool system for indie developers. So if you're interested in that, but we can talk about that. Uh, I'm going to move through. If, if you have Neon-based instructions in your application, talk to us later. There is a, there's a project called Neon versus SSE, which is a header file that macro redefines most of the Neon instructions over to Intel-based instructions. It also has, you know, it, it basically it's supposed to be a drop-in replacement according to your Neon instructions. It also comes with a test harness down here that will allow you to verify that your application has ported over correctly. So there's about 1,700 Neon instructions, and uh, this test harness covers them all. This, if you get nothing out of this, this is really what you want to take from it. <laughs> Hopefully you get something. Um, this is the Android SDK Manager. You're all familiar with this? Yes. So here, Underneath the ARM system image, there is an Intel system image. And then if you go all the way down to extras, there is a hardware virtualization driver. And this hardware virtualization driver is the same sort of thing that VM uses, basically to make your emulator run natively on your hardware. So I, I did some informal benchmarking just on my work computer, which is like two and a half years old. And that's what I just do. And these were the results that I got. Uh, using AN22, which I know is a highly student benchmark, but that's what I use. Um, the, the Intel emulator benched at around 17,700, and the ARM emulator benched at around 2,000. So there is a huge speed up performance, it's about a 7x speed up inform performance. Uh, we, we have a couple of demos, actually not here, but uh, just side-by-side -side performance of the two emulators. And what I, what I want to say to people is even if you're using, even if you're targeting you know, Samsung devices or Nexus devices that are ARM-based devices, 
Uh, use the Intel emulator because you will be a happier developer. <laughs> okay, let's speed it up. Turns out that the mic was in your good piano. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I understand. I understand what. Uh, if you've been developing for two years, good. Why do you need an emulator? Maybe you don't have the device. Maybe you don't have what? Maybe if you don't have the device. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Okay. This, this really quickly is my computer running the Intel emulator versus my Nexus 7 uh, 2013. So you can see it's very performant for real devices. Beacon Mountain. Beacon Mountain is an installation manager that will download, let me show you here, will download all the Google Android SDK, the Android NDK, uh, the various tools that are associated with that tool chain. Also, in addition, it will download the Hardware Acceleration Manager, the Graphics Performance Analyzer, which is an Intel tool that will give you system metrics on your entire, on, on uh, a lot of your applications. I'll talk about that probably after lunch. And uh, several Intel libraries, including the building threading blocks and the integrated performance primitives. It also keeps all of these tools up to date so you don't have to manually update them, which uh, is, can be a pain. Uh, right now, the Intel C++ compiler for Android is free. Go to Intel, software.intel.com, and download it. Normally, uh, the Windows or Mac or Linux version is a fairly expensive product. Uh, but we are trying to communicate and interact a lot with Android. We're encouraging Intel-based Android uh, apps and the compiler is free. Uh, I, I've seen some benchmarks. You do get a speed up in performance depending on what you do uh, over GCC. I'm going to skip talking about threading blocks. I'm going to skip the uh, threading block example because we really don't want to look at threads or what we want to eat. Um, the Intel Graphics Performance Analyzer is a great tool. Over here you've got uh, all your different CPUs, your I.O. I know you can't see this here, but I have it done well here. You, we have your network, your uh, GPU, your OpenGL metrics, your battery, and a variety of other metrics that are down in this area. This tool will let you launch an application on your device, your Intel-based device, and then it will give you real-time performance metrics of the different uh, areas that you select. So if you want to see exactly you know, why your GPU is, is running you know, at 100% or your CPU is low, you can go through and graph exactly what portions of your application are causing that. Uh, the same with, you know, if your application is going to battery quickly, you can see where that is in your application. I want to mention that will also work for, work for ARM applications as well. So if you're running the on an ARM device. Um, no, yeah. Like I tried at Samsung conference. No, 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 no. no. But if you're running an Intel <laughs> device and you're running say, like a Unity app, you want to know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a binary that is compiled for ARM, and you're running it on your Intel device, you can, you can use this. The HTML5 development environment is an environment that we uh, at Intel published about six weeks ago. It's got a lot of cool features that we'll talk about during the breakout session. And that's all. These are operating system trends in terms of worldwide shipments of units. And you can see right here that uh, Android is in the blue at the bottom, Windows is here, iOS devices are here, and then Other is there. But by far, besides Other, Other and Android are the largest areas in which uh, platforms are shipping. And so a, a lot of developers, when they come and ask me, how can I move my application over to another platform, uh, they're going to get a highly dependent answer depending on what their application is. Uh, but if they're just starting out, I do recommend oftentimes HTML5 uh, for certain classes of applications. Uh, I wouldn't put highly performant graphics or highly performant audio applications in this class. But if you've got you know social media type applications, uh, some gaming applications, business productivity applications, these are all great targets for HTML5. And Intel. Uh, our vested interest in HTML5 is basically, first of all, that our CPUs run a lot of different architectures. And so we are interested in people building HTML5 applications because the larger the app community is, the, from our perspective, the better our sales are. 
But also in addition to that, having an active developer community means that there's going to be um, just uh, buzz, excitement, interest in a platform. So right now, these three platforms, for instance, for instance, let's say you have an application and you want to target iOS, you want to target Windows, you want to target Android. All of these systems have their own app stores. So you get kind of a walled garden effect, most people call it. That's kind of the standard jargon for it. That means that if you write your application from one platform, it's only available on that one platform, and you can't move it over onto the other two without totally rewriting it from scratch. Of course, if you're a product developer, that means that you need to hire people that understand the other platform. You need to uh, not only have people that understand it, but have probably had a substantial amount of experience in it. So you're raising your R&D, you're raising your budget. You're also maintaining multiple uh, repositories of code. So this is, this is a high cost. Syncing them is not something that is cheap or easy to do, and I know you all know this because a lot of you are in startups. So, what's common across all these platforms? It's HTML5. And HTML5 is a great way to target all of these different platforms. We're putting up here, I don't know how long Blackberry, well, we keep Blackberry there. <laughs> but um, in general, yeah. So, what I'm going to do at this point is to say, here we go, I'm going to jump down to this slide. And I want to talk a little bit about what a native application is versus a web application on a mobile device. So just like, just like your Java, your Android devices can be hybrid applications, they can have a Java component, they can have a native component. Uh, web applications often are built this way as well because the web platform has a certain set of standards that are, that are created by the W3C and the, and the WG and, and various standards organizations, Konos Group. And these standards are rap rapidly sought after by browser manufacturers, specifically on the desktop side, the mobile side has lagged a little bit. Notably, Android has lagged quite a bit. Android is, in fact, the worst performer in terms of HTML5 uh, feature support of any mobile OS. Um, Blackberry, <coughs> iOS, uh, Tizen, Firefox OS all support more than, than Android does. That's, that's kind of unfortunate. However, Google yesterday did announce, uh, I believe, a Chromium-based web view, which I haven't read anything about yet, but I'm very excited about that. Curious that you mentioned that Tizen does support HTML5? Yes, Tizen, Tizen in fact has the highest level of support of any browser on any desktop or any mobile platform. So if you go to html5test.com, they, they have a testing scale that uh, has a, a top score of 500. Tizen has a score of 492. But and besides, besides that, Tizen does support other things besides HTML. Yeah, it does support Silver. HTML5 is actually the main programming uh, language or environment for Tizen. Right. Uh, and, but if you want to build C and C applications, you can do that too. I'm done. Yeah. So the reason why you might want to actually have a native component is because if the web platform doesn't support a particular feature, then you won't be able to implement it. For instance, the web platform is just, is just now starting to get support for cameras through, through uh, get media, user media APIs. Uh, it has some support for accelerometers, but they didn't used to have this support. Uh, it, uh, it now supports uh, geolocation. That's been in the spec for a little while. But if you want to use specific portions of the hardware, if you want to, for instance, access the Bluetooth stack, you can't do that in HTML5 right now. You have to go with a, a, a hybrid application. So the advantages over here of having a web app is that a lot of web developers have these skills, you can instantly update it, and you have unrestricted distribution. So you don't have to distribute these through an app store, although you probably want to. And native applications, they have the best performance, they have you know, nice UIs and interactions. They can access the hardware directly. And hybrid applications just combine the two of them together. So you have your web developer skills, access to the native platform, and distribution in App Store. So a hybrid application is really where a lot of mobile developers are going that are building HTML5, uh, simply because it gives them the right 
balance of accessing features and being uh, available on multiple platforms. So I'm going to skip through this and go straight to just showing off the Intel XDK. So the Intel XDK was announced was was announced about uh, six weeks ago at the Intel Developer Forum, and what it is is it's Intel's first set of tools that really targets all the different areas that an HTML5 developer wants to be able to do in their development cycle. So up here we have a tab for develop, emulate, test, build, and cloud services, and in addition to this, I'll just walk you through the different parts of it over here. The first area that uh, you can take a look at is the Projects tab. If you come over here to start a new project, once you to log in. Uh, if, you, if you come over there and start a new project, you can look at a variety of demos that are available. So there are some demos that will access the accelerometer. For instance, I have a demo of that right here, the rolling can demo. So this rolling can demo it looks a little let me, let me downsize the device. I'm showing it on a Nexus at the moment. But if we put it on in Motorola Droid, for instance, you can see that the HTML5 application responds there to uh, moving it up an accelerometer around. This is the Emulate tab. So the Emulate tab will let you take your application and test it in a variety of different devices. So we've got Galaxy S's, we've got HTC Droid Incredible, we've got the Motorola K900. We have the iPad, the iPhone 3G, S, the iPhone 4S, and the iPhone 5, and a variety of other things here. I didn't mention Nokia Lumia. And you can change the orientation of your device right here. So you can see how it acts when you change it from platform to from landscape to portrait. Uh, you can look at the information that's associated with the particular image that you're testing on. And you can interact with the accelerometer, like I just showed you here. So the accelerometer APIs that we support are actually from PhoneGap. If you're familiar with PhoneGap. How many of you are familiar with PhoneGap? Okay, good. How many of you are familiar with AppMobi? Great, we support AppMobi too. These tools were actually originally acquired from AppMobi. Uh, Intel purchased a portion of AppMobi, uh, including their tools division. And so this is it's been, I think, about six months in the working right now. Intel has been grinding away on these tools, and this is the result of it. The major difference between the tools that we purchased from AppMobi and this is that uh, we've eliminated the need for Java. So the AppMobi tools are all based on Java. And uh, this is actually, the, the Intel XDK here is actually a large web application. So this application itself is an example of the type of application you can build using this tool. What else can you do in the, in the emulation tab? You can also look at the device network settings. So if you want to configure a particular type of network connection, let's say you want to test your application on Ethernet, uh, on Wi-Fi, on 2G, 3G, 4G, uh, curiously there's no LTE there. There should be. You can change the, the app globalization. So you can see how your app responds if it's uh, presented in global. You can also change the geolocation. So if you've created an application that uses the HTML5 geolocation APIs, you can simulate that information over here, and then your application is going to react inside the emulation area. So and you can specifically put a specific latitude, longitude, altitude, things like that. And then lastly, you can mimic firing uh, particular events to your web application. So if you want to send, if you, if you have custom events that you've created, you can fire them from this point, or you can send standard events like device ready and, and button push and things like that. Uh, the tab that I skipped over here really quickly, I'll jump back to is the develop tab. So this development environment is actually, an, it is actually Adobe Brackets. How many of you know what Adobe Brackets is? No? 
Really? Really? Okay. So in, in, in a lot of HTML5 circles, uh, this, is, this is kind of a darling child project. Uh, Adobe has sponsored it as an open source project. And it's basically, it's an IDE that is, first of all, it's written entirely in HTML5, so this entire editing environment is HTML5 based. Uh, but it's an IDE that specializes in all its syntax highlighting, all its auto-completion, uh, all the features are all specialized around HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, one, of, one of my favorite things to be able to show off that you can do say, is that if you go over to a particular uh, element, I'm not finding a good example here, but let's, let's see if it works right here. If you go over to particular elements, let's say you go to the head element, you can actually inline pull up the CSS that's associated with that head, uh, head element, and you can edit it directly right here. So if I want to make the, the head have some sort of characteristic, I can do it there, and then just close it up, and I'm done. So little nice features like that are the reasons why a lot of people like using this. I actually don't use this, personally, because I have my own editor that I prefer. Um, I tend to use either Sublime or, or Unix a lot of the time. Um, but to each his own, and this is built with that in mind. So if you want to use your own editor, you can do that. I'm going to go over to another example, called the App Designer example. And this gives you, my, my XDK is actually a little uh, old, so I've been told. But um, and the, it doesn't look the greatest when the resolution is as low as this. It looks a little better with a higher resolution. But this is, this is a drag and drop authoring environment for HTML5. So you can go and grab whatever particular types of layouts that you want. You can Row buttons and forms together really quickly. You can edit your application and prototype it really quickly. And then once that's done, it actually generates over here in the HTML5 editor view, plain old HTML5. And you can go and edit this over here and then bring it back over to the app designer. And it actually parses through it and gives you a rendering of it inside the app designer. So you can switch back and forth really easily between editing and the app designer. Any questions about that? One, 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 one thing that I forgot to mention was that for the widgets that we're using here, we support Twitter Bootstrap, we support the App Framework, which is the tools required for Mount Mobi, and uh, we support Adobe Top Code, and uh, I'm blanking on the other one. We support, we, there, there's another tool that we support. Actually, I could probably create a project really quickly. So if I want to start use the app designer, give it a name. Oops, select my project location. Here on the next slide. What can you import? Is it just like made with this or so in importing um, the, the goal is to be able to import standard HTML. Now, this is a beta product still and it doesn't always work. But the, the goal is to have standard HTML be parsable and displayable by the data designer. I, I think the 1.0 version of this is supposed to be coming out towards the end of the year, around the uh, beginning of January. So hopefully it'll be much improved by that point. Create. So it's creating a new project. Let's say close. jQuery mobile? Of course, that's, that's the other framework we use. Okay. So I'm going to switch off that project, go back to my app designer project. Actually, let's go, let's go back to the, uh, let's go to the Towers of Hanoi project. So here's, here's a Towers of Hanoi application. I can look at it here, see that it's not rendering the buttons quite right on top. And let's say that I want to go test this in a device. So right now, in order to test on a device, what you need to do, and this works on iOS and Android, is you go to the app stores and you find an application called the App Lab. <clears throat> it's not Intel branded yet. It's still branded as AppMobi. Uh, we're, we're working on changing the branding over. 
but you look for App Lab, it's an app movie product. It's got a, a, a beaker, like a, a, a chemical boiling inside of beakers that I got. And what you do is you install that on your device here, and you can push your application up to the cloud. Actually, you have to go to the build tab and build it first. And I don't have this internet connection at the moment, so that's not going to work. But you, from this area, you push your application up to the cloud, and then you can download it again on your device. And it's going to have the same HTML engine that it uses to build your final product um, running here. So this is a quick way that you can really sideload your application, basically. So you upload it on Wi-Fi, download it on Wi-Fi, you go ahead and test it. You can change and iterate really quickly that way. The, the other... Is there a question? Yeah. Um, since you guys support like, multiple devices, uh -huh. like, for example, if you need to push to a uh, to Apple App Store, yeah. what, what is the cost? For like, if you have a lot of you, like, you know, not for you to develop a native app. Right. For like, Apple, you need like, some type of like, the low Yeah. Yeah. That is true. Um, I'll get to that in just one second. Okay. So his his question was, um, I think first of all, uh, why do you why can you send your application to iOS and how does it integrate with their entire process for submitting an app to the store? Is that a good way? Yeah. To okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to mention one thing here on this test app, and then we'll go over to the build tab and talk about that. So the, the last thing here on the test app is that there is a JavaScript. Uh, file that you can include when you're testing your application. You just throw it into the top of your index.html and it will let you live debug over here on your device. So if you go to the emulate tab, sorry, yeah, emulate tab, and click over here on launch debugger, you get the full Chrome developer tools. And using the app lab, you can actually use these tools to debug right here on the device over Wi Fi. This is on Google Play or something like that. So it, it, it's actually part of the XDK. You just come over here to view it. Yeah, but how do you get on the phone? Oh, you, you go to Google Play. Yeah, so all, all I get is like this Google app of the same name. It should be App Lab. You know, it's just like that one word. Uh, let's go find it. Google Play. I think it's one word. Thank you, IT, for giving me Skype that crashes. Oh, and it's, it's not showing it because this device doesn't use it. Okay, you look for App Mobi. App Mobi. Yeah, App Mobi's App Lab. Submit your application to an App Store. So right now we support iOS, Android, Windows 8 Store, Windows Phone 8, Tizen, the Amazon Store, the Notes, uh, Note Store. You can also build it as a standard web app, a Chrome developer, sorry, a Chrome extension, or a Facebook application. So it's got a lot of uh, maneuverability in terms of where you want to deploy your application. Oh, and as far as integrating with um, iOS, so let's say we go over here to the build area and upload our code. We're gonna we're gonna create a my VA file. It's going to present us with all the different steps that you need to complete in order to be able to submit this application to the, uh, the iOS store. So in this particular case, we have app details. You have to go in here, submit your, you know, create your icon, give it a name, give it all the different details that it wants. Down here, one of the steps I don't have is the iOS certificate. So you do have to sign up with Apple. You have to go to the normal developer program, pay the $99 or whatever it is now. Get a certificate from them, and you have to put it in here. And when all these steps are completed, over the uh, you can build your application. Let me, let me close this build page, and I believe the Android one is ready to go. App details. Okay, apparently I need to add some details here. Ah. Name of the application cannot be a 64-bit character. 
So I'll just call it sample. And I set the permissions that I want to use down here. So this app uses in app billing. Let's put that to no. Uses geolocation, camera, audio streams, etc. You can also change your, your uh, permissions once you're done with this. Okay, well, it's going to go through and ask me for a whole bunch of uh, steps really creating icons. I'm not going to go through all that. No, no, it didn't. Okay, so now that all my steps are complete, I can just hit the build now button. And it's going to upload it to the cloud building service. Build your application, and in just a moment, it's going to return an APK file that you can submit to the store or test on your device, whatever you want to do with it. Are there any questions about this? If you have specific questions about just HTML5, CSS, or JavaScript as a language, you can also come up to me and ask me. I've been uh, a web developer for many years now. 